industry inside a nutshell. The show where we sail into our port of call discussing maritime history. Evolution and reconstruction of the HMHS Britannic. In April 1912, two men parted ways on board a new ocean liner on Berth 44 in Southampton, England. These two men were friends and colleagues who had worked alongside each other at the Harlander Wharf shipyard in Belfast, Ireland. This was a huge triumph for them as they both worked on the early and final designs of a trio of liners alongside the chief designer at the time, Alexandra Carlyle. In the three years the men worked together, they would design the largest and most luxurious liners to sail on the transatlantic waters. However, one event was about to change the safety of two out of the three liners. While the designs of the Olympic and the Titanic are engaging to research, there's not much attention on the design of the Britannic. It is argued that the design and changes have played an important role in maritime history, particularly in the aftermath of the Titanic disaster. This is the reason why we are choosing to focus on the HNHS Britannic and the two principal men who were part of the ship's process and who parted ways at birth 44 when one of them got off of the Titanic. These two men were the head of the design department, Thomas Andrews Jr. and his assistant, Edward Wilding. Before the construction of the HMHS Britannic, Andrews spent a five-year apprenticeship with the shipyard where he studied inside the drawing office. Following this, he became the manager of the construction works and a member of the Institution of Naval Architects. While Wilding had experience in the Royal Navy and for the Admiralty before joining Harland and Wolfe as a draughtsman. By 1907, Andrews was promoted to his new position at the design department and Wilding joined with Alexandra Carlyle and a handful of draughtsmen to work in a new trio of liners that would become infamous for their luxury, size and disasters. While it is believed that the design of the Olympic class liners was first drawn on a napkin at Lord William Peary's home in 1907 is questionable, the Arrow Gantry and a new graving dock were indeed built near the River Logan as early as 1903 to 1904. These two gantries were built in as replacements for the four slipways that built the ships. Although it's not clear which ones they were, the previous ships may have included the Big Four, the Cedric, the Celtic, the Adriatic and the Baltic. In 1905 or 1906, while White Star Line was observing two new vessels for the Cunard Line, Wilding had made two visits to the John Brown shipyard in Clydebank to observe the RMS Lusitania during her construction process and on the Cunard Liner's sixth voyage in 1908. Wilding had assisted in the design of the Olympic, the Titanic and the Britannic alongside Andrews and Carlyle. Observing the notes Wilding had made from his visits to the Lusitania, the men began to commission the liners, which took them three months. After coming up with various designs, including the infamous Design D, the finals were signed off through a contract letter between White Star and Harland and Wolf on the 31st of July 1908. However, because of the formal letter agreement for the Britannic, she wasn't signed until October 1911. While the letter of agreement was pending, this allowed Andrews and Wilding to observe the Olympic and her performance at sea. When she began her maiden voyage in June 1911, Andrews and Wilding noticed that the Olympic had performed well. Andrews had made recommendations for changing particular operating procedures, increasing the Olympics earning power, improving aspects and adding additional passenger accommodations for both the Olympic and for the Titanic while she was being fitted out and for the Britannic after her construction process would begin. 
But when the Olympic collided with the naval cruiser, the HMS Hawk, in September, one of the changes for the liner, and to improve the design of the Titanic and the Britannic, was to change the centre propeller specification and to increase the pitch of both starboard and port propellers, as making these adjustments on the Olympic improved her performance while she was being prepared in Belfast. In the spring of 1912, Wilding and Andrews travelled together from Belfast to Southampton for the Titanic's delivery trip. But Wilding parted ways with Andrews there before the ship would begin her maiden voyage. Tragically, Andrews would die in the sinking. Following Andrews' death, Wilding was given the promotion to head designer and he took charge of changing the designs for the Britannic. The keel for the HMHS Britannic was laid in November 1911 in Slipway No. 2, where her older sister, the Olympic, was built. When Wilding became head designer following the Titanic sinking, he made and observed changes to the Britannic while she was still in construction. Work didn't stop on the Britannic during the Titanic's inquiries, but Wilding was called to testify at the British inquiry where he explained the design and seaworthiness of the ship, which included the double bottom and the engine room. While the inquiry was taking place, the Britannic had a fully framed to the height of the double bottom. When she was adjusted, the Britannic had a new inner skin fitted, reduced the size of the middle boiler in boiler room number 5 and additional regular and collapsible lifeboats, taking it a total to 55. She also had 5 gantries, 6 welland davits and 2 welland davits on the Britannic's poop deck, a new bulkhead in the electric engine room, 5 bulkheads extending from E deck to B deck and an increasing number of the watertight compartments. In 1915, Wilde testified at the limitation of liability hearings, where he was asked questions about the size comparisons between the Titanic and the Britannic. In the answer to these questions, Wilding confesses that comparing the two liners, the White Star Line, referring to the owners at the time of the Titanic disaster, has made deliberate points on refraining and the Britannic is a little larger but not much. Just a year later, on the 21st of November 1916, the Britannic sank in the Argentinian Sea while on a mission to carry injured passengers towards the Kia Channel. Following the sinking of the Britannic, Wilding remained active in shipbuilding through his career with the Holland and Wolf shipyard, though his life after the Britannic is a mystery. Wilding died in 1939. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe for future videos. Until next time, this has been History Inside a Nutshell, departing from the dogs. Thank you so much for all of your support and enjoy the rest of your voyage.